All right, so I'll start with the most fun question. What's the halal way of approaching a girl you like? <laughs> Even though that's question number 12, I thought, you know. Um, so uh, this is more complicated. We've, we've made it more complicated than uh, the Sahaba. So the Sahaba were simple people. And they came from a very rebellious society where men and women did all kinds of things and nobody cared. And then Islam came. And I want to give you some background here. You know, in, in Medina, when the Sahaba migrated, the Muhajirun were bankrupt nearly, right? They left everything behind. And Medina was a crazy place. Right now it's Medina Munawwara. But Medina back then was Las Vegas. It was bad. When the Prophet went there, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it was not a good place. Okay, you have to understand, it was a crazy, crazy society. For instance, one of the most common industries in the city of Medina was prostitution. When the Prophet moved there, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the women that were, there were brothels, like prostitution houses, they used to have flags outside their house. That this is a place you can come for those kinds of things. And a companion comes to the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and says, Ya Rasulullah, uh, there's a woman, because he doesn't make any money, he's a muhajir. There's a woman, she makes good money, I'd like to marry her. And what, what does she do? Oh, well, you know, she's in the... You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm not going to spell it out. And those, you know why I'm telling you this? Because Sahaba didn't even know that's a bad thing yet. They were also learning, weren't they? They didn't become angels overnight. They were being developed. And so he doesn't even think... And imagine, you come to Rasulullah and ask this question. Can you imagine somebody coming to uh, an imam today and saying, hey, so uh, I'm thinking about <laughs> the next janaza would be of the shaykh. Like, it would be <laughs> and then the ayat came, no, you cannot marry those kinds of women in Surah An-Nur. Like revelation came to teach sahaba and teach the believers, look, those are not the kinds of people you want to marry. They are their own, you know, don't mix with them. You know, like Ibn, Ab Ibn Ashur says, uh, Rahmahullah, in his tafsir, that ayah is referring to professional prostitutes, that the zani will not marry a zani, is referring to them, because the question was actually raised. I wanted to bring this up to you because for them, you would think that, you know, if, if the Sahabi saw a woman from a mile away, he went the other way and made istighfar the whole night. No, it wasn't like that. They interacted with each other, they talked to each other, they worked with each other, they were in business partnerships. All kinds of interactions happened between men and women, but with principles. It was respectful, it was dignified. And when a companion, when, when somebody likes somebody else, you know what they did? Here's the astaghfirullah part. Here's what they did. Hey, I like you. You want to get married? And she'd say, um, maybe, talk to my dad. He'd say, okay. And then you go to the dad and say, hey, I, I like your daughter. And she's, I mean, I talked to her, she's not entirely opposed to the idea. Is it cool? And he says, let me talk to my daughter. How this happens today in London is you go to a girl, respectfully, hey, we worked together for three years. Would you consider marrying me? And she's like, ah. Uh. <laughs> and maybe she says, please don't talk to my dad, he'll kill me. Because if you talk to my dad, They'll say, this is why you go to work? This is why we sent you to uni? Like, you fathers, I have four daughters. I have four daughters. Listen, th those of you that are fathers, that have daughters, you sent your daughters to university. You brought your daughters to this country. You made them live here. You, brought, you took them outside in society. You made that decision. And when somebody like a Muslim likes them, that's a good thing. How are they going to get married sitting at home? Who's going to like them? So when somebody approaches them in a respectful way, you should not say, oh my God, the day has come, astaghfirullah. <laughs> you know, ye din bi dekhne the, oh, taba taba. You know, what a humiliation. Now we have to go take you back into Bangladesh and hide you in a village somewhere because <laughs> some guy likes you. Astaghfirullah. You know, and there's a, you know, somebody's in ruqya on her and, Calm down. It's okay. You're, somebody likes your daughter, that's a good thing. Now you're go and investigate, find out. It's completely fine. The only rishta mentioned in the Quran, the only approach mentioned in the Quran is that of Musa alayhi salam in Madian. 
He was by himself. Musa was by himself. And these girls were by themselves working outside. And he went up to them and helped them out. And the girl said, he's kind of nice. And she, she went back to her dad and said, hire him. Which means, come on dad. <laughs> you know. And that happened. And the girl said, I like the guy. That's actually what happened in the story of Musa. Musa didn't propose, the girl proposed. And the father can't propose unless he has the approval of his daughter. So it's okay for your girls to say, Dad, there's this guy, this brother, at the MSA, yeah? <laughs> he does the, he's a Thursday halakha. It's really good, you should come. Your daughter's telling you something. It's okay, go attend the halakha. It's okay, find out. Don't complicate this. There's nothing indignified about that. Don't go date a girl now. And don't take, oh, son, no man gave a lecture, I'm gonna take you out to dinner. No, no, no. Not that either, but can you have respectful interaction with someone you're interested in for marriage? Absolutely. Absolutely. Nothing wrong with that. Can you take your time to understand each other's likes and dislikes? Yes, it's fine. Respectful courtship is okay. With parental guidance, with di in, in dignified fashion, there's nothing wrong with it. So what happens is we have two extremes. We have people that are more conservative than the Sahaba. And then we have people that are more liberal than liberals. Okay, and the Islam is right in between. It's a natural way. It's a completely natural way. Okay, and so th this is something that I thought it's important to mention for families and for yourself. Talk to your daughters. Ask if they like someone. Don't create a, between fathers and daughters, there should be open communication. They should not be terrified to tell you that they're interested in somebody. Don't force them to marry someone they don't want to. Don't force your daughters to, and, and tell them, if you don't marry this one, who's going to come and marry you? And you have to, we already said yes to them. Don't humiliate the family and say no now. Those kinds of nikahs are haram. I will say it, they're haram. You cannot emotionally and psychologically force a girl to get married under family pressure. That is batil. And that happened at the time of the Prophet And the Prophet considered those nikahs batil. They're, they're invalid nikahs. Until the girl genuinely likes a guy and says, yes, I want to marry him on her own from no pressure from her father, no pressure from her mother, no pressure from anybody else. She likes him. And even if the day of the nikah, she says, Mom, I don't want to do this. The mother doesn't say, too late, girl, too late. We've got the hall, they're all, what are people going to, no. If the girl says, I don't want to do this, then no, stop. Allah gave her that right. You cannot take it away. You're burying them alive. This is the new way of burying women alive, by the way. Back then, they used to take the baby girl and bury her right then. Now we bury them at the day of the nikah. This is what we do. This needs to stop. Let them marry who they want. If they're a dignified Muslim. And because now you're living in a different society, you won't find someone from the same village. It's okay. It's okay. A Bangladeshi can marry a Syrian. It's fine. I know. It's okay for Syrians too. Yeah, you, Syria. Turkish. Somali. Astaghfirullah Somali. Yes, Somali. It's fine. <laughs> you know? You know, Musa alayhi salam is an Arab. Musa is an Arab. Or, or, or actually not an Arab. He's from is he, is he Israelite. And he married an Arab. He went and married in Madian, didn't he? So many Arabs. Uh, we only marry Arab. Really? Musa alayhi salam was actually from Israel. What's up with that? You know? It's all good. You, so it's, it's, it's a time now, it's a strange time that we live in. And actually the only thing that can save us is the basic principles of our deen. And getting, facilitate, making the path to marriage easy is actually one of the greatest battles against shaitan. When we make the path to marriage difficult. When you have 28, 30, 30, I'm not going to do other questions, forget it. Let's just talk about this. What am I going to do? We're going to have 35 year old boys not married. You, what do you think? They were doing tahajjud for 35 years? <laughs> What planet do you live on? They didn't do anything haram. No evil thoughts went in their head. They didn't go to university. They didn't go to work. 28, 29 year olds not being married. This is ridiculous. It's absolutely absurd. It's unacceptable. It's unacceptable. And we, we create standards that don't exist in our, in our religion and don't make any sense. You have three daughters, four daughters. Somebody proposed for the younger daughter and no proposal came for the older daughter. No, 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 no. We go in order. Who said you go in order? Which sharia? If there's a good blessing that came to your home for whichever age, why would you deny it? What will people say? What will Allah say 
when you explain yourself to him and say, I deprived my daughter of a good nikah because it wasn't in order. What will you say to Allah? You tell me that. What are you going to do? Ridiculous. This nonsense needs to stop. Marriage needs to be made easy. And the guy's side, because Hindu tradition says, the guy is the gift. So the girl's side has to give him gifts. Islam came and said, the man has to give what? Mahar. The man has to give a gift. The woman is a gift to the family. And now we do in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Southeast Asia. No, no, no. We don't want jahez. We don't want gifts from the girl's side. But there should be something. At least a fridge. You know? <laughs> that, that is the opposite of what Allah commanded. That is the opposite of what Allah commanded. You're not only disobeying Allah, you're reversing what Allah said. Asking to pay, to be gifted, because you're the girl, you know, the, the, the guy's side? That's like way beyond haram. I don't even know what the category that belongs to. Shaitan is giving you like five stars for that one. <laughs> do, do not fall into that category. Don't give your daughter-in-laws and your wives gifts and then ask for them back. Now this is happening. They'll give them jewelry at the wedding. No, that was just for the photos. <laughs> really? Allah Azza wa Jalla will describe this. You know, لا تأخذوا منه شيئاً أتأخذونه بهتاناً وإثماً مبيناً Don't take a single thing from the spouse that you've given to them. Are you taking a huge accusation against your own self and taking clear sin on yourself when you agree to a mahar? You know, nowadays the, the, the fashion is they don't discuss the mahar until the day of the nikah or the minute of the nikah. Before then, when the mahar comes up, they say, oh, it's family, it's okay, we'll work it out, it's okay. And then the time comes, and then the girl says 50,000. <laughs> and they're like, oh, the guy was, poor guy was eating biryani and gets stuck in his, you know, like, 50,000? And then his uncle whispers in his ear, it's okay, nobody pays it. If you have no intentions of paying mahar, your nikah has been valid. If you have intentions of asking your wife to forgive the mahar, you're committing a grave sin. You can't even ask for a discount. You cannot, you're not allowed. You can't, and you can't give it when, you know, you decide. She decides when it's given. That's her right. That's what validates the marriage. Don't agree to a mahar you can't afford. Don't agree to a mahar you, can't, you have no intention of paying. Don't agree to a mahar that you intend to get forgiven. Oh, if you loved me, you would have forgiven it. Why, do you, why, why does money have to prove that I love you? Because it's mahar. And because you can't use that kind of language. If they, out of their own free will, out of the goodness of their own heart, decide to give you some of it, like you gave the, the, you know, the thousand for the month to her of the mahar, and she says, here's, here's two pounds, get yourself an ice cream. That's up to her. <laughs> If she wants to do that, she can do that. But you cannot. That's not your money. That is not your money. These things, why am I highlighting these random things? These are the things that we have introduced into the institution of marriage, making marriage difficult. And when you make marriage difficult, the door to zina is wide open. The door to corruption is wide open. Our, it's unnatural to think that an 18 year old, 19, 20 year old guy, girl, are going to be in university and they're going to be there for five, six years and not develop any emotional attachments. And then for them to randomly marry a cousin back in Lahore. <laughs> That's not going to happen. And if it does happen, it's a form of oppression because she's emotionally attached to somebody else and no man wants to be with a woman who's emotionally attached to somebody else or vice versa. It's oppression. Sometimes you're denying a nikah only because it wasn't you. You didn't come up with it. The guy says, I like the girl. No, you will pick, you will marry who we say. Why? Who said? It's a mistake. I don't like it. I don't like that girl. That's not your problem. That's his problem. He's an adult now. Let him make that mistake. If it's a horrible mistake, so be it. But Allah gave those young men and women the right to pick who they want. Parents can give advice, yes. But when you try to control what your children are doing, it will only lead to disaster. It will only, only lead to disaster. I'm not giving license to 12-year-olds and 14-year-olds who say, well, it's not that I can marry whoever I want. No. <laughs> I'm talking about mature adults. 
I mean, I've met young women that are 25, 26 year old, accomplished in their careers, pharmacists, physicians, you name it, and they, they like somebody and they want to marry them, family says, no, that is absolutely dhul. Nothing else can describe it. That is dhul. If a woman says she wants to marry someone and he's a Muslim, there's no reason for you to stop it. You have no right as a family to stop it. This is wrong of you to do. You're abusing a right that Allah gave you, abusing it. It should, it should not happen. And for young men, the last bit of advice is for young men, become men. Earn a living. Be dignified. Don't offer like dates for mahar. The Sahaba used to give, what, in, what other thing are you a Sahabi? <laughs> other than the Kit Kat you want to give for mahar. You know? <laughs> no. Be dignified. You know, earn, earn a decent living for yourself. Don't say, I, I like her, I don't have a job, but I don't know, they're only, her family is only interested in dunya. Yeah, that's why we have mahar. Only interested in dunya. You're supposed to be concerned about dunya too. Wala tansa nasiba kamina dunya. It's in the Quran. Don't forget the portion you are owed in this life. It's a worldly decision too. It's not just a spiritual decision. How, was, how is somebody going to provide for my daughter? Where is she going to live? Is she going to live a decent life? These are respectable questions. These are decent questions. So these things we have to take very, very seriously in our communities. And it, when it comes to the subject of marriage, I didn't talk today about what happens after marriage, because there's a whole set of dhulm we do after marriage. That for another time, I'll yell at you another time. But right now, let's just fix, fix the institution itself. Let's make marriage easy for our young people, especially the ones that are ready and capable. You know, man istata'a minkum al ba'ata fal Whoever among you is capable, let them get married. Capability, if capability is there, no other barrier should be there. And for those of you that will find this controversial, it's okay. I'm leaving here anyway soon, so that you, you deal with it and troll me on the, on, on the, on online. So I'll tell you if, you know, your, if your son wants to marry somebody who just took shahada yesterday, right? Or the girl wants to marry a guy who just became Muslim a week ago or something. And then you say, well, he only became Muslim because he wants to marry the girl. It's not a real shahada. Who decides what a real shahada is? Who decides? Can you tell why something happens? When Osama, you know, the, the famous narration of Osama came, that he was about to kill someone in battle. In battle, he's about to kill someone. And the guy falls, loses, the enemy loses his sword. And he's about to strike him down. And he says, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. He took shahada, became Muslim. Did he become Muslim because when he fell down, it hit him really hard on the head and all of a sudden Islam started making sense? And he's like, hold on a second, I think this, we need to stop this and I'm ready to be Muslim now. Obviously he took shahada because he knows Muslims don't kill each other. So he took advantage of the opportunity because he's losing. If he was the one on top, he wouldn't have taken shahada, would he? So he's on the bottom and he takes shahada. And Osama sees it and says, yeah, right. <laughs> he killed him. And when that happens, this news reaches the Prophet Did he, Is it obvious, like 1,000% the guy took shahada for the wrong reason? It's obvious to anybody who sees it. The Prophet says, what will you do when that la ilaha illallah comes for you on judgment day? That's what the Prophet said. That shahada will complain on Judgment Day, I wasn't respected. And that's in the most obvious of cases. When somebody says they've taken shahada, who are you to question their reasons? That's between them and Allah. It's okay. As a matter of fact, even among the Sahaba, there were those, somebody said, I want to marry you, and the, 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 the woman was a Muslim, and the guy was a non-Muslim. And she said, you're not Muslim. He goes, okay, I'll become Muslim. She says, okay, fine. I need to become Muslim. And they got married. Done. But you could say, Astaghfirullah, he married, he took shahada for a woman. Yeah, but the Prophet was okay with it. Why are you have a problem with it? The Sunnah is okay, you're more Sunni than the Sunnah. <laughs> you know? So what you need to do now, what you and I need to do, is understand that we are in a challenging time. And our children are exposed to the, the, the worst kinds of haram are no big deal now. They're accessible, they're easy, and they're not hard to, to fall into. And in that environment, when the opportunity for nikah is there, please, it is a grave crime for us to deny that opportunity. To, to consider, of course, give your children advice. I think this is a bad nikah for this reason, this reason, this reason, but the decision is yours. 
the decision is yours. You have to share sincere advice. You do. But at the end of the day, they'll have to make their decision. And if it was a bad decision, so be it. It's, that's okay too. That's their, their mistake to make. That's a better mistake than the mistakes they will make outside of marriage. You understand that, right? And that you won't even know about. And you'll tell yourself, no, 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 my son, my daughter, they would never. Really? Really? Because you come from like an angel family? Your son and daughters don't have hormones? They don't have emotions? They don't have attachments? They don't have obsessions? They don't have temptations? They do. Don't be deluded into thinking your child. He's a good boy though, he prays. Yeah, what is prayer going to do? What is prayer? If you say, Inna salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar, that works to an extent. But Allah created us with an, a fitrah. You're denying that fitrah. So this, I know I went on a rant, but I, I felt like I had to do it. May Allah Azza wa Jal make marriages easy for our community and bless the marriages that are happening. May Allah Azza wa Jal give the, the, the husbands the strength of character and the understanding to be good husbands and the wives the kind of commitment, loyalty, and understanding to be good wives and thus raise wonderful families. Barakallahu di walakum. That's the end of the question and answer session. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.